since I've been a kid. I've mowed lawns in a Speedo, um, went to romantic dinners in a Speedo, and ran around my entire downtown or cities in Speedos. Mesdames et Messieurs, the greatest festival of our contemporary society, the Olympic Games, is about to begin. This is going to be close. Oh! You can do it! You can do it! Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant! But that is an Olympic champion. Ready? Hello and welcome to another episode of Olympic Fever. I am your host, Jill Jarris, joined as always by my lovely co-host, Allison Brown. Allison, hello. How are you today? I'm doing okay. How are you doing? I'm doing well. We are back in the water today. I'm really excited. I know. <laughs> you know, but we're talking water polo today and we're talking with Tony Azevedo, who is legendary in the sport. He's been a five-time Olympian for the United States and he was really interesting. Yes. And I learned so much more about water polo than I ever knew. So, And then we have some other huge news that happened this week. Oh, my gosh. This I know. Hit my it's... email at, like, you know, end of day. And I just went, what? I know. <laughs> USOC decertified USA Gymnastics. And, <sighs> yeah. Do you want to talk about that first? Yeah, let's just get the breaking news out of the way. Okay. So what does that actually mean? was my question. You know, what Mm -hmm. does it mean to be decertified? I was kind of confused. And what was particularly amusing to me was I used to be a member of USA Gymnastics (laughs) and I really (laughs) didn't even know what it did. But it not only picks the national team and manages all those issues, but they're the organization that accredits all the gyms, all the coaches. You got to be a member to compete at any level. And now the USOC is saying... U.S. Gymnastics, you are such a disaster that we are shutting you down. Which is crazy because it's it re- big. Yeah, it's really unprecedented. They've done it to USA Handball and USA Judo, much, much smaller sports, much, right? much smaller organizations. I think I read that USA Gymnastics has 250,000 members. Wow. And over 3,000 gyms that they've that are so this is this is big and this all stems from the Larry Nasser uh, sex abuse scandal and what a mess they made of that and how they're not protecting their athletes so i don't quite know what's going to happen and but the USOC is not playing no they aren't man it was yeah it was incredible and it's interesting that they waited until after the world gymnastics championships the world artistic gymnastics championships because i understand uh a trampoline is still coming up yeah but let's be serious how yeah, many reporters are going to be at the trampoline competition and what's so crazy is you know simone biles historic world right because she came away with another all-around title Another all-around title, and now she has a world medal in every discipline. Okay, and Uh, she matches what Svetlana Korkina. Korkina, yeah, yes, that's okay. (laughs) I was trying to get the good. (laughs) I know (laughs) Svetlana Korkina, and and Svetlana had has uh, twenty medals, right? And so Simone also matched that twenty medal, but at worlds, at just at at worlds. worlds. You know, we're not talking about any other competition, but that is an amazing feat. And, you know, she shows no signs of stopping. And she, you know, she did it while battling a kidney stone, which was also crazy. (laughs) So Worlds was great this year. There were so many really exciting stories. But this and they uh, USOC was very smart to wait Mm -hmm. because all the gymnasts, all they would have been asked about was this. Right. And, And I would imagine that many competitors don't necessarily know the inner workings all that well. Well, I think the big the big difference is you've got people like Allie Raceman and Simone Biles who are not peaking at 17 years old anymore. Right. These girls are sticking around for more than one Olympics. They're seeing the workings over a longer period of time. Uh, the Corollis are gone. So that mm-hmm. whole sort of cabal has disappeared. Right. 
So I think we're seeing the cracks that have existed for a very long time. And hopefully this will, you know, this will be good for the sport. I mean, you went to nationals and you were Mm -hmm. commenting how there were no sponsors. There were no, you know, excitement as compared to your experience at the skating nationals. And I think that's all because the USAG is a disaster and has been for a long time. So I think the USOC has the gymnasts at heart and I, it'll be, it'll be interesting. I mean, they got two years, not quite a year and a half until Tokyo to get their act together. Right. So, so I mean, it gives them hopefully enough time to build something or hope. I I'm really curious because obviously USA, the, Sport is so popular, I don't think. On to happier things. On to happier things, indeed. So we had a conversation with Tony Acevedo when he told us all about the sport of water polo. Tony is the greatest water polo player the U.S. has ever produced. He is a five-time Olympian who won the silver medal in Beijing. And while playing for Stanford University, he was the only four-time winner ever of the Peter Coutinho Award water polo's version of the Heisman Trophy, or if you don't pay attention to college football, it's the highest honor you could get in the sport nationally. He played professionally in Italy and Croatia and retired from the national team in 2017 after a final game in the Stanford pool. We talked with Tony about his about the sport and his career, so sit back and take a listen. Let's start off with the game itself. So water polo is two teams of, what, six on six? Yeah, two teams, seven on seven, six field players, six field players, seven, uh, the, and a goalie. Okay. And in the field players, you have different positions, right? There's attackers, there's centers, there's defenders, correct? That's right. I, I think the, the easiest way to describe it would be basketball. You have a center who's your big guy, and... You have a center defender. See, in basketball, the the center is also defends the center, but in water polo, the center, then there's a center defender. And then just like basketball, how there's attackers who drive toward the cage or run picks to get open and get to the basket, the drivers are the do the same. They run picks to end up getting open to the goal to shoot and score or shoot from outside. I, I was watching a, a video of you – uh, before before we got on the line, and in one of them you say, water polo athletes are the quickest, strongest, smartest, best condition, and also mentally unstable. <laughs> Man, what what kind of crazy through, do you have to be? All through my five Olympics, I just <laughs> I went through a whole. Let me think on that one. Well, look, I the way I the you know the reason I'm passionate about the sport so much is is because. You know, I can remember going into the first Olympics and walking in there with the NBA, you know, dream team. And everyone on our team was so obsessed with taking pictures with every single athlete in the Olympics. And me too, I'm 18 years old. And I remember our captain telling us, you guys, we work harder. We get paid less. (laughs) We're more passionate. (laughs) Like, it's great to see these guys, but have pride in your sport. And then going overseas and seeing how famous water polo players are in countries like Serbia and Croatia and Hungary really gave me this sense of pride. And when I go back and saying we're the quickest, you know, I think every sport has their strength. But the fact that we're training an hour and a half in the gym because you got to be strong, then you got to swim. And in a lot of senses, we swim more than a swimmer does. Then on top of the lifting and the swimming, you have about four hours of tactical training where you're shooting, where you're working on legs, which is a whole other aspect of our game. And now all of that comes to all the million tactics that come to your mind and the pressures, really just like any sport. And probably the instability comes from the fact that we're always in Speedos no matter where we are on a beach. And and, uh, we're just (laughs) very (laughs) happy-go-lucky guys. (laughs) I think like every sport has its own, like it takes a certain kind of crazy to do any sport, but uh, it's fun to hear what kind of people are drawn to water polo. (laughs) (laughs) 
Hey, you know, I always said I got in the 2004 Olympics, they did like a survey of who the fans' favorite athletes they interacted with, right? And a lady came up to me and she said, water polo won. This is 2004 in Greece. She's like, why do you think? And I go, well, since I've been a kid, I've mowed lawns in a Speedo, um, went to romantic dinners in a Speedo, and ran around my entire downtown or cities in Speedos. So there's some level of comfort that we have that I think people <laughs> relate to <laughs> compared to, you know, a lot of other athletes where they uh, maybe have a little more of an ego than, than we do. <laughs> okay. we're both trying to process that one i know we're both like okay now where do we go with this from here <laughs> but okay one of the questions i had about watching the sport you've got these green and red lines that they kind of uh shoot across the pool what do those stand for so there's a two meter line and a five meter line is that what you're talking about? Yes, yes. So uh, a five-meter line is basically where the penalty shot takes place, but also the area where you can get a foul, and after a foul, you can shoot the ball. I don't know if any other sport has that, but basically if you're fouled inside, then you have to pass the ball. If you're fouled outside, you can pick it up immediately and shoot if you want or not you can pass it does that make sense the, for the five meter <laughs> not yeah, really but okay uh, Jill, Jill's smarter one, than one I am so let's just go with that one <laughs> <laughs> and then the two meters think of it like soccer where you have an offside where a player can't go within those two meters on offense unless the ball in there with them okay okay so it's like in hockey where you've got the area in front of the goalie that you can't be. Yeah, sure. Exactly. <laughs> so unless you have the ball, you can't go in. So you see it in soccer, like the guy's open, has the ball, but he was inside the the last player. Well, ours is oh, right. the, you have to, the ball has to be in, in the two, uh, inside of that two meter line in order for you to go in there. Okay. On an offensive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And the ball itself is, is it, I mean, when I see you hold it, you can get from one side to the other with like your pinky and your thumb, and then you use the middle <laughs> three fingers to kind of guide it. it. Do you have really big yeah. hands or is it a smallish ball? It's, uh, you know, I, I'll probably, a lot of guys in our sport have enormous hands where they could palm it like a baseball. But I'd say on, on average, uh, you're, you're just doing your, your pinky and your thumb, and it's just the more you play with the ball, the more comfortable it is. I'd say that's the one area where we're behind in the other sport. It's such an important part to have a high-quality ball, yet our ball hasn't changed in 50 years. <laughs> so it's pretty, it's pretty ridiculous. Where We're out training for nine hours a day, and then all of a sudden we get into the Olympic Games, and we have this ball that's you know, the same ball they used in the 1980s. What is it made of? Do you know? It rubber. Oh. Yeah. What What would be a good change? What would be a better material? Or how would you change the ball to make it better to work with? Well, I think you, the, it doesn't need to be as big out there. And we need to play around with, with the grip. I mean, there's a lot more different grips no one's ever done. If you look at some of those basketballs where they have the bumps, more of a grip strength. I mean, that's where most balls, a football, basketball, they have that for a reason because it molds to the hand. We have these weird lines. So it's funny. I just had that talk to someone a little bit ago about, you know, how, how have we not really made an effort to have the best quality ball so that we can have an amazing game instead of guys dropping the ball all the time because it slipped out of their hand. That's unacceptable. I mean, they're putting – they're putting glue on the receiver's hands in football so that they always catch the ball. And uh, in our sport, no. But you can you can make up for it by playing a lot with the ball, lots of passing, lots of uh, tactical. 
Because I know when we talked to um, Sarah Gaskin of Handball, they also use a stickum on their hands for the ball. Yeah, that was so. So, so there's so, no stickum in water polo. So it's illegal. Yet when I was playing overseas, because of the pools, uh, when I was living in Montenegro and Croatia, one of the biggest sports out there is, is handball, and this spray that came from Romania is what all these handball players use. And so in outside of the, the high level competition, you're allowed to use this. And it was phenomenal. I mean, <laughs> I'm sitting there faking the ball. Like I've never in my life. People are like, what happened to you? I'm like, this, this glue. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and it didn't come off in the water because a lot of the pools had were salt water pools and, and the ball would just slip out all the time. So they allowed us to use the glue. But yeah, the glue is something we'd love to use. And, stuff. and guys still use it at the Olympics. It's just they have to hide it. Referees will call them out. But, oh, how interesting. We, we just yeah. thought doping was a problem. We had no idea gluing was the, uh, <laughs> the controversy in water polo. My goodness. <laughs> now, gluing and we need, we need someone to do the plate gate. Because the PSI, which is the, the level of pumping of a ball, is the same as it was. It is for like a basketball, except we don't want ours so hard. So it makes it a rock and that's much harder to play with. Those are the two things when it comes to just the simple thing about a ball that the last two Olympics were the biggest issues (laughs) for all of us players. So there were controversies with the PSI where people under like under inflaying their own or damaging others. before games, you'd send your youngest player and he'd go to the side and he'd deflate all the balls to the wow. normal level. And then if a referee found, he'd, you know, he'd yell and they'd inflate it back up. But it goes to, there's not one. And I was, you know, the, the, the president of the water polo players organization. I mean, every single player understands that if the ball's over too hard, A, you're risking real concussions and problems, but B, it's just impossible to grip. Unless you have hands that are the size of, you know, small children. Can... <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, we're you. You can't see that we both <laughs> our jaws hit the floor at just about the same time. We were just like, oh my god, deflate gate in water polo. That's amazing. <laughs> yep. That so exists. in in terms of the players, I mean, obviously you guys are all pretty tall, pretty strong. But what makes a good physical water polo player like how tall are all of you well i'm i'm probably the shortest (laughs) yeah literally the international international competition i'm probably one of the shortest on average you get countries like croatia montenegro serbia that are just enormous countries you know they're they're in their six seven six eight you get a six ten i would say on average we're six three six four is probably a water polo player's average size and then the biggest difference that, you know, we have is our legs. The water polo, the, the strength comes from the legs. You may see an enormous guy with an enormous chest that can, you know, you're thinking, man, that guy's super strong. But if he doesn't have legs, he won't be able to play our sport. So most of our training outside of swimming and, uh, and lifting is focused on the legs. And we have a an exercise that's called sculling where you basically put your feet in front of you and you're laying flat in the water and your feet are in front of you and you got to go toward your feet. And so that creates two muscles on your ankle and your shins that no other sport uses. No one goes the opposite way when, uh, you know, when in the water. So those are things that we have to work on over and over, especially at a young age to, to grow those muscles so that you can compete. Do you have muscles in your feet? <laughs> I always do with my clinics. I go, see, take pride. Look at this. And there's this big ball in my feet. And they're like, what's that? I'm like, yep, that is a muscle that only we have in water polo. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> I'm like, you got to learn how to skull first. Wow. <laughs> so being that it's such a, a sport that attracts taller people, what are some of the qualities that you have that make you some one of the best in the world? Well, you know, to me, the best, the greatest player ever is the only player who's gone to six Olympics 
and he's a 5'9 Spaniard, Manuel Estiardi, uh, who's now the right-hand man for Pepe Guardiola and has been for years since he retired. And, you know, as a smaller player, obviously you have to be quicker. You still have to have really strong legs. But I think like any sport, it comes down to it comes down to your your smart. You know, and I took pride my whole entire life. Something that my dad always says is emotional intelligence, which I really took pride in every practice. It's it's easy and being an athlete and after you retire you realize it it's it's not that hard to train five hours a day or six hours. It's hard to make those five to six hours quality. And there's very few people in the world have to, that can show up every day and get five to six hours of quality out of their training and think about what they're doing and why they're doing it instead of just going through the motion, which is the easiest thing to go through. I'm still stuck on the muscle in the foot. <laughs> <laughs> and just that you're doing exercise, you know, that whole idea of doing things that other people aren't doing. I think is really interesting. And just the idea that you, you have to do all these different pieces, the water and the land and the tactical. It's a very mm -hmm. complex sport and doesn't look that way when you're watching it. I know. And, and people just, you know, I can swim, I can play. And it's funny because we did, I did a speech in club med with a bunch of sports scientists and they asked, I asked to do a clinic. And so I just asked them to do one simple thing. The first thing I asked them to do, just to explain them water polo, I said, put your two hands on a ball, put your head in the water, and go that way. And there was about 80 of them. No, no one could do it. <laughs> no one could do it. And, you know, it's, it's those things that are, that are fun on, for my side. But I think open up, wow, you know, there are these little in intricacies that people need to know when they play this sport. Because if you don't have that, which is what we're seeing now, going back to what I'm doing now is we lose so many athletes a year or that have talent that have every capability being on one of the best. But if you can't do that simple exercise when you're 18 years old, chances are you'll never be able to play at the international level. Why is that? Is that kind of like trying to learn a, a, sec a foreign language as an adult? It's much harder to make your body do that. It's exactly it. And then for a coach to really spend I mean, when you, if, you, if you've made it to a high level at 18 without that, I mean, you've, you're, you're a getting through on all these kind of you're, – you're getting by with all these bad habits that will show when you get to the na international level. And if you need to work on – I mean, if you, you literally have to spend three years with this kid just going over every single day <laughs> the same. And, I mean, it could happen. I, I, that's that's wrong to say, but on, on most likely at 18 years old, the kid can skull. You're not going to waste three, four years as a college coach on someone who hopefully is going to learn that how to skull, unless he's just phenomenally talented. You're saying, okay, this is all you need to do for two years is this. That's amazing. And does that make it harder for the U.S. since we are not known for our extensive national water polo program at high schools? And youth sports? hundred percent. That puts us, and that, that puts us way behind. I mean, we have more water polo players playing in the U S than all of Europe combined. If you think of that number. Okay. Yet on our women's side, we're extremely successful. We're the best in the world. The men's side, you know, we're, there's probably one player now. There's three players on the men's side now that you would consider top in the world and two of them came from the european motto which is uh, luca luca cupido from italy and alex rosa from netherlands and one alex bowen came from uh san diego and so we have all these players but they're missing the key fundamentals to get them to that high level i look at it when i was in croatia i'm, I'm watching a kid i'm watching a kid all these kids kick a ball the same way Every single one of them. And then they receive a ball the same way. Okay? Well, all of a sudden, Croatia's in the World Cup final. Because they all have the same base and fundamentals. And then it just takes passion, perseverance, you know, to, to separate who's going to be the best. We don't have the base here. 
So our base is maybe 1% of the, 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 the players. And for us to grow to the top without a base, it's an uphill battle. I hope that makes sense. No, that absolutely <laughs> makes sense. You know, the idea being that the best athletes are not necessarily ending up in water polo. Yeah. Or we get them. And so what's happening now is there's a huge influx of athletes coming from football, especially in places like Texas, Chicago, where they just opened up where, you know, hundreds of high schools will now be playing water polo. Well, there's not hundreds of coaches and you're getting players from Texas and I'll go out there and do a clinic. I mean, this guy, you're thinking 10 years ago, he's playing football. He's just starting quarterback. Well, we're getting him and we're thinking great arm, great talent. But again, if his coach isn't teaching him those basics, he can't get as good as he can be and his talents being wasted. So I see a lot more wasted talent around the world too, not just the U.S. Um, outside of Europe. Well, Europe has that's all, all they do is those fundamentals and talented that are not, at least this kid has that base. Now, are they switching because of the concussion issue? Switching to what? Uh, yes. Leaving, leaving yeah. football or leaving those. But water polo is not like it's not a contact sport. Yeah, you know, and I think it's interesting. I've had that conversation. I think as people get wealthier, their focus changes. They don't want to have their kids possibly having, you know, brain damage in football or the culture of some of the other bigger sports of how education is maybe not as important. And water polo as a contact sport, you don't have concussion issues. We don't have – our biggest thing is tendonitis in the shoulders. That's, that's our thing, you know. You play water polo, you could have a problem with your shoulders. But, I mean, that's just – that's really overkill in any sport, especially how all these sports are going to early age one sport only, which I'm totally against, and that's creating more and more injuries in my opinion. Yeah, your, your biggest problem is you're running around in a Speedo all the time. <laughs> Getting good tans, though. Yes. And it, in Chicago, that could be a whole other level of a problem. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So why are the Europeans, especially the Hungarians and like Italy and the that whole Adriatic Sea area, why are they so into water polo? Well, you know, culture started back first team sport one of the first team sports in the Olympics and in nineteen hundred and then these sports were pretty dominant back then. And it just grew from there. I mean, when you're a country like a Hungary or some of these countries that can't compete by any means at the soccer level or the basketball level when they're years ago, and all of a sudden they go into a sport that at the Olympic level, they're winning gold medals, they start to become heroes. You go back to the Russian Hungary game where Russia just, basically was leaving Hungary as they were, you know, ransacked <laughs> or took over Hungary. And it's called the, the bloodiest game in the water. The water turned red because of the fight, yeah. but it was just the tension of this. That was the last straw. Hungary's done. Hungary's now independent. Russia's gone. And water polo was the game to show that. So I think a lot of key moments in history came through water polo. It became popular. You go to, go over there you're on tv everyone knows who you are i mean i'm here everyone's like what the hell is that guy doing and you go over there and i remember going to dinner one night and the next morning in the newspaper it says the american loves our wine i'm in croatia <laughs> i showed up first day and it shows me pouring a a wine to my wife the american likes our wine <laughs> so things like that exist over there you were a tabloid star tony <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing except, except i couldn't except i couldn't read the newspaper article so that doesn't, doesn't help <laughs> probably <laughs> just as well so what's the prof what what is the professional circuit like or what's it what was it like and what's the what's the season like for a professional circuit how long is it so it's long you know we go uh we go from september to june september to end of may 
and you know you're basically you're beginning september october about november you start your champions league like they do in soccer and then you have your local and national championships in may and june you finish you usually get a week off and you go straight to the national team for about two months and then you get about two weeks off holy cow when you're when you're playing pro what how many games a week do you play Usually two. I mean, I'm not on average. I wouldn't say it gets to two, but you know, you're going two, two, one, two, two, one, and then you get like two weeks of just one, and yeah, you're playing a good amount. And then if you're not in the Champions League, then you're just usually doing one, one a week. Okay. Wow, that is a long season. Yeah. And you played for a long time doing that. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, for us, there was, (laughs) for us, there was, there was no other means to to make a living. It was, I mean, going back to really my retirement now after the Olympics, you know, it's, it was either, do I stay, I have two small kids now, do I stay another four years living from apartment to apartment, making, you know, going from country to country, do I finally go home? and make my own, have my own coffee machine and my own bed, which I've never had. And so that was a big decision. And if you live here and try to train, there's, it's just impossible to keep up with the, the Europeans. You're going from 60 games a year, nine months of training to training on your own. It just doesn't exist. Wow. One other question I have about the sport aspect of it is – one of the things is like the rules seem to be for actions that happen on the surface, but under the under the water, anything goes. So, what kind of tactics do people use underneath the surface? Well, there's no tactics. You don't, you know, you don't. You wouldn't go in saying, you know, when he turns his head. <laughs> there's dirty players and there's clean players. The dirty players are usually the ones that aren't as fundamental, as fundamentally sound as the other players but having me you know been said you learn at a young age things you do and you don't do for a guy you don't turn on your back for a ball because you expose a part that you don't want grabbed and as a defender if they expose you're gonna first thing you're gonna grab is that referees just can't see it head doesn't go underwater ever that's your number one rule in playing water polo swim with your head up because if it goes down that's when you can get hurt but Besides that, I mean, you you keep your hips up so no one can knee you in the chest, and uh, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> oh man! So uh, you make it sound so simple. <laughs> that's the amazing thing. And I know when I'm watching water polo, there's a lot of stuff and a lot of kicking and grabbing going down underneath there. So. Well, you know, it, and it looks it looks especially in the center. It looks more the centers. They're definitely the guys. I mean, all the centers go. I would. They all make fun of me because I'm the, the driver. They're like, oh, my, our, our life is so much harder. And uh, it's true. They, they get, you know, they're more in contact. They're grabbing and, and kicking and kneeing each other. But in the end, it's just a lot more white water under there. And the grabbing doesn't hurt. Like I said, the, the things that hurt, if, if some hit your face and if some hit your chest and if somewhere grabs somewhere you don't want. Look, the guys, we don't really have pro- – the girls are mean. The girls, on the other hand, they're grabbing everything. They have all this suit. They're, like, pinching. I mean, I, there's a whole bunch of stories from the girls. Well, we had yeah, talked jumping. about how somebody uh, became exposed. Was that at Beijing? Was that what we I were talking so. about? yeah. One, of the, the, one of the women? Sort of, yeah, yeah. Kind of lost yeah. most of her suit during the game because it was pulled off. Yes, that happens. <laughs> a good amount. <laughs> you were very young when you went – to your first Olympics. Uh Did you, did you get it? Did you understand what you were getting into or were you just kind of a starry eyed kid? Starry eyed kid. Mm -hmm. I mean, and and going back to why I think so too is, you know, these guys I went into as my idols, right? All these guys that I played with were guys I looked up to watching them in the 96 and the 92 Olympics. And going in there yeah I mean there was no I'm just going to go out there and play and I and you know I didn't feel the pressures that you do later on and uh I just you know didn't even know 
all the players and the other teams. I just knew oh, I'm good and I'm going to go ahead and uh, <laughs> score on this guy. But, you know, definitely start at, cause I can even remember, you know, not the best with interviews saying, <laughs> you know, saying the first thing that comes to my mind, which definitely wasn't the thing to do as an 18 year old. <laughs> yeah. So young, starry eyed with, uh, but that's how you learn. So one of your, actually, before you became on the uh, member of the team itself, I understand you were a ball boy at the 96 Olympics. Yeah. So that what was, was that, that was, like? I mean, that was the biggest moment of my life. Like before that I, I was good, but not really known and really loved baseball. And it was really watching then. And I was at the gold medal game with Spain, my idol, Manuel Ciardi, and Croatia playing the gold medal game. And seeing these grown men crying, kissing, hugging each other just changed my life. And uh, my idea of representing, you know, a baseball team in a city or representing a high school college team in a city compared to representing their entire country, there was nothing that I was... Uh, no comparison. And so that's when I really changed. And I sat down with my dad and, and another coach and said, what do I have to do to go to the next Olympics? And at that point they were like, well, you're, you're short and you're, you're fat and uh, you're slow. <laughs> so I lifted, I swam, I lost weight and slowly and surely four years later and made my first Olympic team. I think you went through puberty. I mean, you were a baby. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You were a ba- I mean, uh, oh, you know, I think about a 14 year old kid making that decision. There's a lot that has to, <laughs> that has to happen to have that mindset. So young is amazing to me. Thank you. And then, and it goes back to me a lot. What it was just, you know, my dad took me to the practice. I knew of water polo. I loved it, but I loved baseball. I played a lot of other sports, but he, I was never pushed. And, and, and when I wanted it, that's when I decided you know, it was all me. And I kind of set my little goals and just did everything to accomplish it, you know. Five Olympic Games, obviously lots of memories and like up and down in terms of results. 2008, you got the silver, which was probably a highlight. But what do you, when you think about all of them together, like what are some of the highlights of those games? You know, uh, obviously 2000 kidding me first olympics australia just phenomenal and playing as well as i did was great and then you move into 2004 we don't go walk to opening ceremonies because we played croatia who is number one in the, in the world first game and with no time remaining i score the winning goal to beat the number one team in the world which started us off you know, I get goosebumps about that moment. And then we lost to our rivals, Serbia. And let's see, obviously 2008, beating Serbia for the first time in like eight years uh, to get to that gold medal game. And then, you know, I, I, I'd i say Rio going into playing where I was born in front of all the family that I didn't even know I had and who were never able to see me on TV or watch me play. And I'd, I'd finally learned Portuguese, so I was able to do interviews in Portuguese. And to me, that was really special as well. Uh, result wasn't there, but same time, it was a different team. We were the youngest in the world by far. And, uh, you know, it's a game of one mistake leads to another. And we made a big mistake in the Croatia game when we were winning. And, and uh, I think that kind of set the tone. So first Olympics, you were obviously very young. Last Olympics, 16 years later, you were the captain. You were certainly the, the senior player on the team. What kinds of things were you telling the kids on the team in terms of handling the Olympic environment? I mean, the things that, you know, all those meetings with the USOC tries to teach us, you know, don't get overwhelmed. <laughs> don't, don't eat everything you can in the village. Don't... Uh, you become starstruck and running around and taking pictures with everyone. I think it was just more under like 
teaching them to take pride because the way the way I look at it is, you know, I, I want I wanted to have an impact on every player and especially toward the future. If there's a way that I could help change how they look on their sport. And so a lot of it was just, look, we've worked so hard to get here. Let's not lose our focus. You know, my, my biggest, I would say trait was people probably hated me in practice because I pushed people to the edge because I wanted to see them crack. <laughs> Cause it, if they're cracking in a practice, then you know how they're going to react in a game. And then it was easier to help and work with them. So when it comes to the Olympics, it's just keeping everyone calm, knowing that we train harder than everyone out there. We're pushing ourselves every day, have confidence, and uh, just, yeah, trying to have them enjoy, but yet stay focused. And that's, that's a tough thing for, <laughs> for anyone, but for a group of young kids, too. It's, it's got to be tough. What do you think about the future of uh, the national team? Well, you know, I think that, like I said, our women are still the best in the world, which is phenomenal. Adam's done a great job uh, taking over from Guy Baker. And Maggie and our girls are just phenomenal. I mean, they're just pole rats and, you know, years ahead. On the men's side, I think we have to take a deep look, you know, and kind of understand what's our, who are we? who is the United States of America and water polo and do everything you can to create that culture worldwide or nationally. And uh, talent wise, I'm telling you that last team I've never had sat there and seen more talent, but I think a lot of it comes down to a culture that needs to change and, or a culture that needs to be put in place. We're, we're, we're a team that can beat the best team in the world, but that can lose to the last place team. That's where we are now. So when we can get that consistency and get also another big issue for us is, you know, you're asking guys, when I was playing, the salaries were very good in Europe. You're asking guys who are graduating from schools like Stanford, Princeton, USC, UCLA, Cal, to go live in a country that may pay you what would be minimum wage here. And then you come home and, you know, we all know that, the, the NGBs and the governing bodies and USOC can, can only help so much. And for us to keep players around that long is going to be a battle. And especially if these guys aren't going overseas and they're going to start training at home alone. So unless we can figure out a way to supplement their income, get them sponsorships, or create a professional league here, it's going to always be an uphill battle for us. Well, and one of the things you're doing is putting together an aquatic games, correct? Yeah. So for the last two years, we've done an aquatic games, which is just an international kind of water polo tournament where I'm focused on nutrition, education, a lot of things that, you know, we tend to lose sight on nowadays with all these tournaments and things going on. And we're trying to involve swimming and other aquatic sports and just kind of, you know, create an environment that kids can get inspired and maybe learn some vital things. We spend so much money on these camps and these clubs, and we're not spending enough time, you know, we put our kids in the sports because they teach you amazing lessons. Not because, you know, I know we all want our kid to be an NBA star, but, you know, <laughs> initially it's a great learning experience, kids playing sports, learning failure, learning how to deal with the uh, you know, adversity. And uh, sometimes we lose sight. So I'm trying to make sure we cover all, all ends. And then you also have a, an app for, for water polo as well, right? Yeah. So probably it's out now, but probably in a month or two, we will be releasing. So my, Matt and myself and Maggie Steffens, best women's water polo player in the world, have partnered. And basically, we are trying to bring technology into water polo bring more in you know high-end videos teaching specific ways how to skull how to egg beater so that all the coaches all over the country can say oh i need to work on this and we can start working on that base of fundamentals i talked about then we have a scoring app which you, a kid can start or a parent can start updating all their kids 
scores and you're starting to see all their percentages and they can look at it a more analytical way. And then eventually we have a lot more ideas as to how we can bring technology on this board. It's just crazy the way the world's going in sports with technology. And we just felt that uh, if there was two people to do it, it'd be me and Maggie. <laughs> so. Very cool. And that's called... That's called 6-8 uh, Sports. All right, Tony. Thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate you sharing your experiences with us. Great to talk to you, too. Great. Thanks Thank so much. So appreciate much. it. Good. Thank you so much, Tony. You can find Tony online at TonyAzevedo.com and follow him on Twitter at WaterPoloTony. On Facebook, he's Facebook.com slash USA. On Insta, he is Tony Azevedo 8 That's the number eight. And then you can check out his new company, 68 Sports, at www.6-8sports.com. And we will have links to all of those in the show notes. Dude, I did not know how hard water polo was. I, oh. You know, it was like when, when we talked with him, when he talked about sculling, because, well, let me back up, because we got a lot of questions from people like, ask about the egg beaters, ask about, and, and treading in the water all the time. And I didn't realize there were like multiple versions of treading in the water, because when he talked about sculling, it was like, what what is this? And once we got off the phone, I immediately went to the YouTubes. <laughs> And it was like, oh my gosh, sculling is like egg beaters horizontally, basically. You know, you yeah. just they, it, it was crazy when you see their feet move. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, so after we got off the phone with him, I then began to stare at my own feet to figure out where <laughs> the muscles could possibly be in one's feet. And so I, I really want to see a water polo player's feet. I know. In person now. I know. Annie Leibovitz, where are you with your Olympian images, right? <laughs> I know. I'm glad we didn't meet him in person because I would have been creepy. I was a, I was already a little <laughs> bit, I was a little bit like the grandmother who asks your boyfriend inappropriate questions <laughs> when we were talking. And some of that will be in bonus material. <laughs> so thankfully, I, I wasn't like, ooh, can I see your feet? <laughs> and one thing he did mention that I did want to mention was the blood in the water match, which we know you and I know that I'm totally obsessed with. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I just wanted to put it in context. So it is probably the most famous water Olympic water polo match ever. It was USSR versus Hungary in the semifinals in Melbourne in 1956. And it was, in context, there was a, hun a student uprising in Hungary, or started as a student uprising, spread throughout the whole country in October and November of 1956. The Soviet troops move in, put down the uprising very violently. 2,500 Hungarians were killed. Over 200,000 were displaced. And then less than a month later, the Soviet Union and Hungary meet in the pool. And it was crazy. There literally was blood in the water because of an elbow that Irvin Zador took in the eye. And there's a very famous picture of him with the blood running down his face. So the Hungarians won, eventually won the gold medal. But it, it uh, I want somebody to write a book about this match. And nobody's written a book yet. Hmm put it on the list but it is like you know we have in the u.s our, the miracle on ice this is like the miracle in the pool it's a, a kind of a very similar situation well not very similar because we weren't being invaded and right you know being displaced and having a lot of killing but you know there's still that tension but yeah this was a huge deal and it's so interesting how sport reflects and can kind of absorb what people feel in real life and it's an outlet for those emotions and a way to channel what you feel about a particular situation that might be not related at all, but you kind of act it out in sport. Right. And yeah, it and it is really interesting to read about this match. And I, I think there's probably a movie about it, isn't there? Because there's something on YouTube. There's got to be a Hungarian movie about this. There doesn't seem to be. There's some sort of pieces of dot, like when people talk about the 1956 
Hungarian Revolution, there'll be like a little section on this, but there doesn't seem to be one on just this, you know, just the blood and the water match. And so this is so right for movie making, Hmm. you know, because all the men were these, you know, we talk about the water polo men having beautiful Adonis bodies. So Mm -hmm. you can put, you know, handsome men, there's got to be some girlfriend that was involved. You can have the love interest. (laughs) And Irvin Zador did a lot of interviews later in his life because I believe he uh, eventually moved to the United States. So it's there. So, I mean, Hollywood, come on. I want the book and the movie. All right. We'll work on it. Have our own little production company. And speaking of movies, before we forget, Boys in the Boat, Oh, that's right. That's right. That was really exciting to see. So on our Facebook page, and I hope people do this in Twitter. Facebook group. It's our Facebook group. Yeah, I want some dream casting. Oh yeah. Tell me, you know. You know who who I thought about? I thought about the the boat maker. I wonder if Jude Law would be good for that. Oh, I like that. See, I haven't come up with any dream casting because I'm really bad at that. Right. And I, I'm not sure of who the honky young stars are these days. I know. I don't know anything. I'm like, oh, is Sylvester Stallone still around? <laughs> I'm like, I have no clue. I can't tell you the last movie I saw. So, <laughs> well, yeah, get on our Facebook group or tweet at us and let us know who you would cast in the Boys in the Boat movie. Absolutely. On that note, I think we don't have any other updates for this week. All right. Thank you, everyone, for listening. We will catch you back here with more Olympic stories next week. And in the meantime, keep the flame alive. Stay in touch. Email us at olymfever at gmail.com. That's O-L-Y-M fever at gmail. You can also leave us a voicemail at 530-763-3837. That's 530-70-FEVER. We're on Twitter at Olymp Fever, and you can join in the conversation at our Facebook group, Olympic Fever Podcast. Thanks again for listening, and until next time, keep the flame alive. I'm still stuck on the muscle in the foot. <laughs>